Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, my two trusty co-hosts, Chris Dredes and Marissa Di Natale. Hi, guys. Hey, Mark. Hi, Mark. Another, Hi, Chris. Another busy week. You know, just when you thought the banking crisis was over, well, I don't know. Did you Wait. think it was over? I, maybe <laughs> fingers crossed. You, were, you, you, know? were, you were hoping yeah. it was over. <laughs> I was hoping it was over. Uh, and still am, still am, uh, yeah. but yeah. Uh, we'll see how that but goes. But we've got a, a Fed meeting in there as well to spice yeah, which it up. We definitely got to talk about. And we've got a great guest to talk about all of this uh, with, and that's Diane Swank. Hi, Diane. Hey, great to be here, Mark. Good to have you back. I, I can't remember. Do you remember the last time you were on? It was probably about a year ago. I think. A little over a year ago. Yeah. 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 And at that time, you were chief economist of Grant Thornton, and now you're over at KPMG. I am, yeah, with my whole team over at KPMG. Yes, yes. Yeah. You, oh, did you bring your whole team over? Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. And are you you're are you guys remote or, are you, or is there? A HQ? So you know, I mean, yeah, a lot of the team was hired apparently during the pandemic, and so my team, you know, was in Chicago. And so there's a lot of teams scrambled all over the country, but we're all going in for the NAVE conference, you know, National Association for Business Economics. And so we get to meet in person there and we've not been together enough, but we do get together because it's just so much, there's it's so much more pr productive when you can all see each other in person. Yeah, we, we, I guess we haven't seen each other either, have we? I haven't seen Marissa. Oh, you guys, they, they just don't want to see, see each other. Each other. You know, they might not want to see see each other. Oh, in Phoenix, we saw each other, of yes. course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's all a blur to me. I, I can't distinguish between Zoom and person, and but. Oh, I can. I can. Distinguish you can. Person. <laughs> you can. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, the the move. When did you make that move from Grant? Thornton? July eighteenth. July eighteenth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. And KPMG, yeah. their headquarters, physical headquarters, where is that? Is that in New York or where is yeah. that? It's yeah. in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. But we have a big office in Chicago, AM building, beautiful. It's lovely. You can see, you know, the lake and all that kind of stuff. Really nice. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Um, and you're in Chicago now. That's yeah. kind of home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I just I just keep staying in Chicago. It's just the firms that I work for. <laughs> well, it's a good spot. You know, nice, yeah, I like centrally it. located, easy to get to places. Um, so I'm yeah. a Midwesterner through and through, Mark. You know, always yeah. have been. Always you're not been. moving to Florida like the other half of Chicago. No, and not like no. you. No, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't dip out. You know, no, no, I'm not moving yeah. to Florida anytime soon. I can I can assure you of that. Yeah, it's Citadel, right? It's uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Ken Griffin. Yes. Uh, he yes. made the high profile move and bought like what a. $580 million mansion. <laughs> I don't know. I'm making that up, but it's a pretty big, <laughs> pretty big place. Yeah. Down in Florida. Um, well, very good. Oh, there's a lot of ground to cover uh, the banking situation. And of course the fed did meet and raise interest rates again and recession. And we're going to talk, going to do the statistics game as well. So, you know, maybe we can start with uh, the, the, the banking situation and um let me ask you, Diane, how big a deal do you think this is for the economy? Actually, I think it's a really big deal and because of where I think the credit tightening is going to hit the economy the most. And that's because we've done a lot, awful lot of work that we had been doing about the resilience of the U.S. labor market and how resilient it was. And the main reason for the resilience was in firms with 250 employees or less. And that's where you're going to feel the credit tightening the most. Um, we also did a lot of work on the new business formations, those high propensity business formations. And we found about half of the excessive increase in new job gains, new job openings that we've seen since February 2020, which was around 7 million. They were running at 10.8 million in January 31st, um, 2023. So 50% increase in new job openings. Um, that was nearly four or five of those, and actually a little more now in January, were due to these smaller businesses. And they were more than absorbing some of these, you know, high profile layoffs that we've seen. And um, we even saw, we did some work looking by sector in November, um, the quit rate in places like tech before they had some, as you're starting to get rumblings in tech that all of a sudden they had maybe overshot a bit on some of their hiring. One major firm alone hired um, between 2019 fourth quarter and 2022 fourth quarter, 900, 000, almost 900,000 people. Mm -hmm. one wow. 
and I, I don't use names of firms, you know, like I can't do that, but um, yep. you know, you think about that large, you know, hiring in that one firm and then they had their largest layoffs in history. The first one was 18,000 and the second one was 8,000. You put it in the context of that and you're like, well, that's not very much. It feels like the statistics game. Can anyone yeah, guess? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know, but it, it is really interesting to know how we saw the quit rate in tech picked up dramatically in November and December it stayed at elevated levels. And um, that helped, that was because people were jumping and hopping ships, sort of adverse selection here, because they could, because those skills were still very highly, you know, demanded. Now, job openings on the more high frequency data and places like Indeed and stuff like that, they're starting to slow down and things like, you know, computer software engineers and things like that. But it's still from a very high level. But, you know, we are very worried about where the heart of the credit tightening will hit in you know commercial industrial loans what's going to happen in commercial real estate and you know more broadly the backbone of what we see the resilience in the US economy these smaller businesses that have been able to absorb and new businesses and startups and this has been a highly unusual period for not only startups but the speed with which firms that made the petition to say hey i'm going to i'm i'm applying for a new company that i'm starting here and i intend to hire and, you know, those are running still 40% above the 2010 levels in January. That's the IRS data, the, the uh, IRS data. EIN employee identification exactly. number data. Yeah. And, you know, the compression from two years before from an application pre-pandemic to actually hiring people went from three to nine months um, instead of two years. So, you know, one to three quarters. And you really saw... By the middle of uh, 2021, it was adding about a million new jobs per quarter just from that alone. And so that's a lot to all of a sudden start going in reverse on. And you know that's where I'm concerned that a combination of factors, I mean, I'm sure PPP loans played a role in all this as well, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, a combination of all these factors is gonna hit the backbone of the, the resilience we've seen in the labor market that, you know, it's not a cliff event like, you know, 2008 or Lehman, but a slow moving, you know, sort of squeeze that really will have a pretty, could have a, a, more, a more of a credit tightening effect than I think the Fed had hoped. So the key the cool. key channel you're identifying between what's going on in the banking system and the and the, the I, I call it a crisis. I don't know if that's the word you're using, but it's it certainly is not um it's not not a crisis. So um yeah <laughs> yeah it's not you know, yeah it, it, it doesn't it, feel like a event it's doesn't. Not, I mean it's hard because our crisis you know our thresholds have gotten really high on crises. So there was you know the bar is higher because we've yeah, been through we've definitely been through a few crises. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are really bad crises. The SNL crisis was a crisis that created a lot of headwinds for the economy, which I think are are useful in thinking about now. Um, that was in it. We we remember that, Mark. That was in our early I, I, part of our career. <laughs> that was like the first crisis I really went through yeah. as a professional economist was the SNL, the state, the exactly. savings and loan crisis. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. And yeah. so, well, and then and uh, bloody Monday. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, and you, and you, October 19th, you were 19th. in a big bank. You were in First Chicago. I was at, at a money time. center bank. Oh, yeah. You were in a money we center a, bank had, at the time. We had, yeah. um, at the That's... time, um, I worked for Bill McDonough, who was the vice chair of the bank, who later became the president of New York Fed. And our analysis said this isn't the Great Depression because of what the Fed did at that point in time in terms of infusing liquidity into the system and stabilizing the system that this would not be the Great Depression. And actually, Bill McDonough went down and took over. It was my early years on, you know, starting as an economist. And Bill McDonough, who was the vice chairman of the bank and was our boss and head of strategy, took over the trading floor to stop the panic on the trading floor because he didn't want them to lose all the positions that if they just waited it out, we would be in better shape, which was he was we were right and he was right. So. so, so this is uh, this is this is a crisis, uh, or it's a crisis. Not, it's, it's not it's as not, bad as 2008, and it's not as bad as is uh, March of 2020. Okay, so <laughs> you're you you're, you uh, the the key link in your mind between what's going on here in the banking system and the economy is the availability of credit, uh, particularly to small business, and you've identified small business as and medium sized the, businesses and commercial yeah. real estate. I mean, there's a lot of you know. I mean, the banking sector. You know, well, Mark, you know this. I mean, the banking sector isn't as big as it is in Europe, but I think you know, in terms of providing credit to the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. But you know, we've already got stresses in large firms that are starting to pull back a bit. 
And then you add some stresses in firms that had been the engine of growth and been able to absorb that. Um, and it happens to be where they get the most of their credit. And I think you start to get a much more tenuous situation that's more of a slow moving crunch that is probably not as contained as the Fed would like. Hmm. Hey, Chris, you've done a lot of work in this area too. We had a webinar this past week and uh, to discuss with our clients the uh, impact of uh, event banking, the banking crisis on the economy. And the key channel you identified was the same one Diane is focused yep. on. Anything you wanted to add to what you what you just said about that? Uh, uh, I share her I I certainly share her concern. Small businesses, right front and center, they were already struggling to find credit even before this. Uh, right crisis, right? So banks had already been tightening. Yep. Small businesses were already complaining about troubles finding credit. So this is only going to exacerbate that. And then the CRE, I'm particularly concerned the about is, yeah. uh, commercial, commercial real estate. Market. Yeah. The commercial yeah. real estate component, that's a, that's one that is, um, that's, that's where I sort of get the, the parallels to a little bit of going back to 1990, 91, you know, that was when Chairman Greenspan first said, um, and I, it was actually when I first met him, um, the 50 mile par headwind. And what he did was he was cutting interest rates into the recovery after, you know, it was a very, it wasn't a bad recession, but it was our first quote unquote jobless recovery, which didn't mean that it didn't generate jobs. I think people always get confused about that, but it's like stainless steel. It's not that it doesn't stain, it just stains less. It was just fewer <laughs> jobs, right? You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, right. I mean, and so I think, you know, um, it's an interesting dilemma when we think about, you know, what does the post world look like? Because I actually think we're moving into more inflation prone world in general. Yeah. Um, that's more prone to inflation shocks and rate hikes, yet we could have this tail on commercial real estate that might not respond to interest rates coming down as rapidly as well. Marissa, anything to add on, on this particular point on credit availability and and uh, the banking no, crisis. just that you know we've been looking at things like the senior loan officer survey for a while and seeing that tightening is happening pretty much across the board. But in particular, commercial real estate, I think in the the last uh, survey in the first quarter, seventy percent of banks were saying they were tightening standards on CRE loans, and about fifty five, sixty percent were tightening lending to small and medium businesses. So certainly now we're in a different world than we were back then. And it was already looking very tight. So uh, I think Diane and Chris, you know, that, that makes sense that this is the main channel to be concerned about to the broader and, economy. And just to make that clear to the listener, the senior loan officer survey is a quarterly survey done by the federal reserve of senior loan officers at major a small and mid, mid and large bank size. All, all across the board. All, yeah. All yeah. Across the board yeah. 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 And yeah. they they create these uh, these I guess these diffusion indices the the kind of the net percent of respondents uh, that are say that they're tightening underwriting for different types of lending and that's the data you're using uh, pretty timely data. Well, and, and Mark, that's important too because it's something that um, you know Chair Powell brought up in his press conference that oh know, did he I missed that did he bring well he that didn't bring up? up the senior loan lending survey yeah. but what he did say was there's other measures of financial market conditions that suggest they're tighter than just the interest rates alone. And I think that was, you know, a reference to this. There's also the University of Michigan has in their sentiment index has a measure of, you know, consumers view on tightening of credit conditions. And that's gone up to, you know, the highest level since 2008, although again, high threshold. But, you know, I think it's important that we sort of think in terms of holistically and some of these more qualitative measures as well, rather than just the, you know, what people sort of spend time on with inversion of the yield curve and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Chris. Question, Go ahead. I was wondering if you had a view on the equivalence of the um, tightening of or on credit availability to a rate hike. How many basis points? All right, this is something we've been debating. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we've been debating it too. So we've been running scenarios anywhere from an additional half percent to an additional percent in a oh, Fed funds wow. rate tightening. And so, uh, so just to make that clear, uh, the credit tightening because of the banking crisis is uh, has the same kind of economic consequence or effect as you're saying a half to a full percentage point on the funds rate. Oh, right. that that's very significant. significant. That's very significant. It, it gives you some interesting scenarios. And then we, we shocking the models with more volatility and a an higher um, equity premium. So you get more VIX out of that, more volatility 
in the markets from that, and that gives more credit tightening across the board. And so you start getting, you know, cascading events, and it's not a disaster scenario, but it's certainly a much more, we were looking for a mild contraction. Right. And, you know, now it's much harder to get to that sort of mild contraction, not very high unemployment relative to our demographics. Oh, goodness. So you, before this mess, you were saying- I had a mild You say contraction, contraction but that, I, let's just make it clear. You're saying recession, mild recession. Mild. And it's now mild. I mean, you're mild saying- be, Yeah. I mean, more a mild serious was, recession. we had unemployment rate rising about a percent, you know, and slowly yeah. grinding down inflation and, you know, it's sort of the Fed's recession, which so, they don't so call- So it's three and a half to four and a half kind of recession. Yeah. And yeah. now you're saying three and a half to, to what? Could be as high as five and a half. Oh, okay. oh, so that'd be almost a typical recession, kind of a right. typical World War II, more typical, post-World War II exactly. recession. And, oh. and so, you know, and, and, and when does that start? Is, can I ask? And, well, you, you know, so we actually can get it started depending because of this more rapid tightening now and the non-linearity of it. We can get it started in the second quarter, which is, you know. Q2. It, so now, yeah. like next yeah. month. Next oh, my month. gosh. You are you are pretty <laughs> pessimistic. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to come back to the Fed, but, that, but, because... that's a, but it doesn't really gain momentum until the summer. The summer's the worst, yeah. Of it, and then it tails off. And um, but you know that it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things. And that, that are... can I ask, Diane? That's sure. based on what has happened so far. Are you making some forecast about future problems? I mean, are, do you think the banking crisis is over, or is there more? I don't coming? think the financial situation we're in is done yet. Um, so I, I would coming. like to, I would like to be hopeful yep. that we've contained and put a ring around all of the additional tightening that's going to come besides what the federal reserve wanted to do. I'm not confident that that's the case. And I think that's really important because, you know, we tend to think of, you know, we tend to think of these things in terms of, um, they usually don't play out, play out entirely within the course of weeks or days, they usually take months, even, you know, I thinking back on things like LTCM and, you know, the situation with um, the Russian debt debacle, and then the Thai bot crisis. I mean, I guess we can sort of benchmark our careers, Mark, by um, the number of financial crises we've been through. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting sold now. I can't even remember all of them. Like uh, LTC. Well, I, I feel like I, I feel like that's that's a, you know with my dyslexia. That's my that's my only I, way. Of I, it used to be that right, it used to I be the, remember the current crises, but I, I, it used to be the 1984 collapse of Continental Illinois was like a huge deal. Now, like no one I even wasn't remembers even that. Yet, yeah, yeah, that was a huge deal. And you know, that interestingly, was a huge deal. It was my my so I worked for the bank for Chicago that absorbed many of those employees, almost like a, at the time, I hate to say this, it was like a gentleman's agreement. When I, once I joined the bank, that had already happened. And it was after I joined that that had happened, but um, it was a pretty recent thing that had happened. And um, the bank that I joined at the time was for Chicago, later became JP Morgan. Um, and I worked for Jamie Dimon for four years. Um, but it was, what was interesting about it was they had a gentleman's agreement to hire a lot of people that got mm -hmm. hit by the Continental mm -hmm. Bank failure. And that was really more tied to the oil price um, situation and the oil yeah, bet they made they, than they, the interest rate situation. Yeah. That was, uh, but my, my former, one of my, um, he, he, my children's grandfather, um, he passed recently, a lovely man. He worked his whole career at Continental Bank. And that was a very hard thing for him. I bet. I bet. But, well, but he did he did make it all the way through. But I, I want to circle back, kind of Chris push the conversation a little further than I wanted to go at that moment in time. But that's okay. That was very interesting. <laughs> but I want to come back. I want to come back. And you know, we're talking about credit tightening and, and yeah. trying to understand okay. that. And the one thing we've identified that is helpful there is a senior loan officer survey. I'm struggling to find anything. You mentioned Michigan, but that's kind of on the margin yeah it's on the anything margins. else we should be are you looking at any other indicators so, i mean well you're looking at you must be looking at the treasury market as well which you know we had a lot of short covering that spiked that liquidity back to you know the lowest level since march 2020 but back to the credit standards you know the direct you know that's kind of that treasury market reflects a lot of stuff I yeah mean, yeah no know. well i mean the other thing we're, we're watching is you know we've been watching deposit flows too deposit flows okay yeah and and, and that data is lagged 
but it does show that, and it does coincide, I think, with the deposit flows that we've seen. Um, part of the stress that was in the system that many people didn't see is that, you know, depositors were fleeing for money market funds, but also just looking for treasury bonds. I mean, all of a sudden you could get a return working your money elsewhere than a bank and so, a higher return. So, and I think that that's another issue that hasn't really been, that was happening way before, you know, for a while building up. And so you wonder, you know, I mean, there is a bit of, um, there's obviously some outliers out there in what's going on, but there's also some consistencies that I think we have to look at more broadly in terms of, you know, where are depositors looking to put park their money and how fast, you know, I mean, it's a comment that Jay Powell made as well as, I mean, how fast people can move money now and how fast that is occurring um, is really something very different than what we had in the past. And, you know, I'm even thinking, you know, Mark, we, we were there for flash crashes and there's things that have happened quickly, but this was a very rapid event. However, there were signs of it earlier. And, you know, I kicked myself and I know you've kicked yourself oh, yeah. too for, you know, yeah. how much, you know, did Should we have seen this? Yeah. Yeah. At you least know, some it, of it. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, Can I, movement and deposit flows, I should have been looking at that sooner. Now I'm paying attention to it. Well, but, you know. I, I saw the deposit flows, but I didn't connect the dots to how much stress that was, you know, here kind of, yeah. we were talking about this the other day or at the webinar yesterday. The thing I, you know, I, I, I look at these things from a 30,000 foot level down, maybe yep. I go to 20, maybe I go to 10 and I look and I'm, I'm, if I look at the aggregate statistics across the banking system, you know, it, you know, I expected some deposit outflows because you saw a surge in deposits during the pandemic because right, of right. savings or the the fact I can't go out and spend. Uh, right. So I'm not surprised by that, but I think it's you need to look at the distribution across all of the banks in the system because there's those banks kind of like out on the tail. That's where the problems, you know, are. And if you if you're looking from a ten thousand foot level and don't look at the distribution, which I I failed to do here. You miss it, and I, yeah. and I, I think that's that's the issue. Yeah, uh, and but well, it I, gets to the issue of where uh, the oh, there's my dog bear. Sorry. Oh no, uh, we're, <laughs> we're dog friendly. You know. We're dog friendly, child friendly. You know, uh, um, crazed economist friendly. You know, we're uh, you know ecumenical. Hey, can I ask though? So the other indicator you're looking at is deposits, and that, I think that's a good one because you're saying, look, particularly for smaller mid-sized banks, that's. The, they they need those deposits to be able to go out and make loans. If the deposits are flowing out, if people are pulling their money out, then they don't have the ability to, it's much more difficult for them to find the funding necessary to go out and make a loan. So that's a pretty good indicator that, you know, there's going to be some credit, credit tightening. Yeah, a, in, in general for the macro economy. And, you know, I mean, other things that I think are important as well is um, in addition to that, it, you know, it really is a more economy-wide thing. Flows into money market funds versus yep. other places. Did you see that data, by the way? Did you see the Pardon ICA, I, ICI data, the most yeah. recent data? Did you see that? Another week of pretty significant outflow, you know? Yeah. From, I mean, yeah. inflow into the inflow. money funds. Yeah, into, into money market lower, funds. Right? And, 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 and then the other issue, of course, is now, you know, watching... I mean, the stigma has come off the discount window, but the special funding facilities, you know, we know who's using those. But I mean, I, watching the swap lines, you know, that the Fed set up. I haven't, I haven't I've been looking well at that at all. Central you, banks. So it, that gives you a sense of stresses in the overall global banking system. And, and you know, I said, you know, this is not just banking. Like, this is financial fragilities. And I think, you know, I, I brought up a little earlier, Mark, you know, that you know, the IMF all of a sudden moved after not moving for a long time for obvious reasons with Sri Lanka with a package. And now they're moving with Pakistan. And there was, you know, as the swap lines were announced, there was dollar appreciation, which then put stress on some of these emerging markets that were already feeling stress. And, you know, one of the things from day one, I remember um, the Jackson Hole meetings and, you know, the 2020, 2021, especially in 2021, talking about normalizing rates and how that could have, you know, where the, where we thought the natural suspects were of uh, fragilities in the financial system were things like sovereign debt and how much sovereign debt we had taken on globally and which countries were at risk as the Fed in particular started to raise rates and would that have any, cat, you know, 
um, sort of cascading effects through the global economy. And there was an enormous amount of time spent in terms of thinking about emerging market risk and, you know, what was the exposure? Was there some kind of, you know, major hedge fund blow up out there that had made a major bet or a pension fund that had, you know, reached for yield um, as yields were so low for so long? All of those things, I think, are things that we need to take into account now. And so those are things that I'm watching as well. So just taking it back to the banking uh, crisis. So senior loan officer survey, deposit flows, and you can, that they have weekly data from the Fed, the uh, the H8 release, you can see what's going on with deposits. Uh, and they're blowing out of the system right now. Uh, money market uh, funds, you can see from the, uh, it's called the Investment Company Institute, I believe. They publish yeah, they data publish. on yeah. flows in the money funds. If there's a lot the- of flow in too, that's coming out of deposits. Right. Hey, Chris, are you, have you looked at the recent data around uh, discount window borrowing in the bank term funding facility? Did you see that recent data coming out of there or not? Not the most recent one. But okay. It came out yesterday. Yeah. And it, that showed another sizable this time a sizable increase in the bank term funding facility right i think it was yeah, up right. to yeah. 55 billion 54 billion yeah discount yeah. window borrowing still very high so these are ways banks that are having trouble uh, with deposits and in liabilities funding can get uh, fill that hole uh, so uh, they're calling upon the fed to provide that liquidity that they need to meet their deposit outflow so those are all good good timely thing, weekly things to watch, I guess, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. and, and, and you know, what's interesting to me is the stigma that's come off the deposit window. Yeah. And to me, that is how the system should work actually, because, yeah. you know, we, I mean. Stigma want- mean, meaning a bank who you, you previously, historically, if a bank went to the discount window, everyone said, oh my gosh, this, this bank is in trouble. And then it became self-fulfilling that everyone right. stopped doing business with them and they were out of business. So. Right. And so it was, you know, and so you couldn't go to the discount window and you couldn't do what it was meant to do. Right. Yep. You know, and be a backstop. And now, you know, I do think it is serving more of the function and, you know, maybe that's a legacy of 2008, you know, one, nobody wants to be, I, I knew a lot of bankers who were not happy about having to be, everyone had to sign up and say, we're all using the discount window now so that it wasn't a stigma and, and they weren't happy about what that meant for them to have to do that. And, um, but at the end of the day, that may be one of the positive things from the 2008 crisis that, Mm -hmm. you know, we now have a more functional system Mm -hmm. that, you know, doesn't penalize banks in this kind of situation because. You know, the other, the other indicator, I I just throw it out there where there was never a stigma was federal home loan bank advances. So the federal home loan banks provide loans to banks who put up treasury and mortgage securities as collateral, kind of sort of like the bank term funding facility. Um, And that also, those advances have also surged to record highs. Also indicative. And I think that's weekly data too. I'm pretty sure we can get weekly data, certainly monthly data. Uh, And that's another good indicator of, you know, uh, uh, potential stresses in the system. And that would translate through in terms of, of credit availability. Well, and, you know, all this we're looking at is part of what you would expect, right, from the Fed tightening. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, so this is this is part of normal. This is, you know, part of how the it works. This yeah. is how it works. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, the hard part is, you know, you never know it, it, the, the word. And, and actually, it was, you know, I was I was thrilled that Jay used the word in the press conference. He looked really it, it, it was rough rough couple of weeks, 12 days for me. He actually said 12 days. I was expecting to say 12 days and how many minutes and how many hours. Yeah. Um, but you know, there was um he used the word nonlinearity. Yeah. And you know, when I'm talking to my audiences, I'm like, you know, I, I found out only one in four people knows what exponential actually means. So um one in four? Is that yeah, a yeah apparently a, one in four official survey? <laughs> one apparently of, that's one of so four. one one of us in this group does not know what exponential <laughs> means. <laughs> well it's it's funny because my son my son has said you know well you know, it's clearly not the people around this table. So who yeah. is it? But, um, but you know, nonlinearity. You know, it, that is hard for people to get their hands around too. And I'm like, well, you know, you don't want to get to moments where you know you've got the straws sort of piling up on the camel's back. You don't want to break the camel's back. But it doesn't necessarily mean the back breaks per se. But it does. The weight goes up more. Yeah. And the nonlinearity of of this tightening that we're seeing now. I think it's much less predictable and we're all want, trying to assess how much and, and like, you know, to Chris's point, how much is this even pa- Powell said, you know, Chairman Powell said, you know, well, it's a guess on how much yeah. tightening 
this is equivalent to. Yeah. And I think that's a really hard, I mean, I'm having a really hard time getting my arms around, you know, the numerical estimates. Yeah. Well, we came up with two to three quarter point rate hikes. It's equivalent, the economic so, consequence, which so is not it's in your ballpark, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's not far from where we are. Yeah. yeah. So 50 now, to 100 is, is yeah. But there is a, a an offset here. And I'm just curious how big an offset you think it is. And, and Chris, you've also done work here too, is lower interest rates. So as you, as you pointed out, treasury rates are down a lot. Yeah. Uh, now, mortgage rates and corporate bond rates haven't come down nearly as much. In fact, I don't know, right. Chris, if high yield corporate bond yields even come down, uh, maybe they've just- They probably widened out. I, I haven't seen I don't the think, did they week? actually go up? The yields go up or the spread? Yeah. The spreads went over treasuries went up, but did the yield go up? I, I'm not sure that the yield went up. Do oh, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I think I think they're pretty then, flat. Then yeah. the issue too is, you know, and, and the, the mortgage one is an interesting one because, you know, the housing market, we know it's so grossly undersupplied. I mean, this is just, you know, yeah. I mean, there are people who've got their houses. I mean, I'm, I'm in a house that's paid off because I've been in a long time and, you know, it's paid off in full. But, you know, then you've got, that's what, 42% of the market. Then you got over 90% in some kind of a fixed rate mortgage and they just don't want to move. And you've got people sort of tearing down their existing house and rebuilding it to trade up instead of um, that's, you know, a new thing that's going on. But on the mortgage side of things, um, you would expect to see, and this is the part that we're trying to grapple with as well, is even as rates come down, because we've seen every time rates come down, you got those buyers that, you know, especially at the, at the any, any supply that's out there, they're still bidding wars on the, the, the cheaper entry level stuff because people want to buy it. That's where the millennials are aging into um, and they want to get those, those homes. Um, and there's just not much supply. However, you know, I would, you know, counter that, I would expect to see even tighter mortgage market conditions in terms of lending standards. But in in by who? In terms of by in terms the jumbo of, market, you mean? Because Fannie, Freddie, and FHA aren't right. Going to so they they can do that, but in the jumbo market in particular. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, I mean, you get to the jumbo market pretty quickly in terms of they do have different jumbo markets for different markets, obviously, because um, they're what's considered entry level in New York is not considered entry level in a suburb of Chicago. But um, there is, I do think there's going to be some tightening of lending standards as well that are just, you know, going to be a little harder for people on the margin to get in. Yep. And, 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 and that, and that, you know, that, that may not have much of an effect because there's just not that many people that can get in. Right. Right. You know, the number, the volume of activity is limited. Right. I think the, at least from memory, the, Jumbo market's probably a quarter of the origination market. So not it's meaningful, but yeah, that gives you context. But Chris, mortgage rates have come down, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, they've come off their highs. Yeah. What yes. is how far have they come down? Do you know? I think they were at six and a half last six time. Six and a half, yeah. And they went over seven. They were over seven. So we're down about a half a point on, yeah. on fixed mortgage rates. So that should help a little bit offset things, no? It should. Well, and and the issue is how much activity do we get out of it because of the constraints in the housing market, right? Mm -hmm. As well. Mm -hmm. So I would expect a lot of demand and you see people going in with adjustable rate mortgages, which, you know, I understand why they want to do that because they think, well, in a year, maybe rates will be lower and why lock into a higher rate, get in the door um, and buying up whatever comes up and supply on the new market is a little more, that, a little more supply, although it tends to be skewed very high end. Yep. So, so this match between supply and demand. Demand is at you know sort of three hundred fifty thousand, four hundred thousand, and demand and supply in the high end and the new market is much more expensive. They're trying to come down, but you know they they had built a lot of more expensive homes, but the um, supply anything that comes online I expect to be snapped up pretty quickly. But most people don't want to sell. Yeah, yeah. And okay, that, so, you know, so so just to you do get some offset. Get but, some offset. I just, okay. but I just don't think it's a big enough one that, you know, the housing first in, first out. And, you know, all of a sudden our housing price scenarios look a lot more, um, look stronger than they would have even, even in the beginning of the month, because, you know, rates now look like they're going to be a little lower and it doesn't seem, I mean, it's been amazing how little a movement in mortgage rates has brought people back in given affordability. Yeah. It's interesting. So we've, we've got this Credit tightening, big negative. We've got a little bit of a decline in interest rates, not a whole lot, maybe on the mortgage side, not so much on the corporate side. 
So maybe a little bit of offset. So a pretty significant offset. Hey, Marissa, are there any other channels that you can identify between this banking crisis and the real economy? You know, we there's credit, there's the, the, the availability of credit, there's the cost of credit. Is there any anything else you can identify? Any other channels? Uh, no, I think jobs is is the other one that Diane brought up, which goes to credit. Could go di- it could go directly to the financial services industry too. Um, so yeah, I think I think those are, I think those are the main ones. You yeah, know, Chris, just, any any other channel? I'd say the elephant in the room is confidence. Yeah, right? yeah, uh, that, yeah. If uh, that gets consumer, into when you yeah. start hitting the volatility and the um, risk premium. Yeah, yeah. So That's if when consumers, you start getting uh, nonlinearity. <laughs> yeah, if they uh, if they lose faith, even with a cheaper mortgage rate out there, they're they're going to be right. cautious and, right. and pull back. And if that happens, right, we're going into recessions. Right. So if consumers are spooked by all this, and certainly judging by my anecdotes in my family and the questions I got around, is my money safe? You know. Yeah. People are pretty nervous, I would say. Uh, so the question is, it, are they going to run for the hills uh, or not? That's the key question. And so far, right. we don't have any evidence one way or the other on that one, do we? Not nothing out there so far. Okay. I was I was with a group of uh, CEOs of credit unions yesterday, and um, they were they were saying just how many calls they're just getting from you know depositors. depositors. Just yeah. is everything okay? Is the bank okay? Am I going to be able to get my money out? Um, so it, it seems like just, just talking to people in the banking industry, you know, everyone is a little bit skittish by this. Right. So, um, yeah, I think the confidence channel you're right is, is huge. Yeah. So, so Diane, here's the key question, given everything we just said, and given obviously your view that the economy is headed to a recession here, uh, quickly, why in the world would the Fed raise interest rates as they did this week? What, what's going yeah. on? So clearly they wanted to signal their confidence in the banking system, although they rolled it back from, you know, just two weeks ago. Seems like an eternity in the economy's case. Just two weeks ago, we had the chair, you know, Jay Paul say, you know, 50 basis points, the next meeting and a higher terminal rate. Um, and so going to quarter point, they decided that would be a signal in their confidence in the system and where we're at and that they were basically from where they were assuming somewhere implicitly about a half percentage point tightening in the, in, in the overall economy um, due to the credit tightening we have. That said, you know, my own you know, view would have been to um, do a pregnant pause and say, you know, we'll deliver later if we need to, but let's assess where we're at given we know there's tightening in the system. And, you know, what's interesting to me is still, I think the concern at the Fed is, um, one, I think they want to delineate interest rate policy from financial stability, which um, I'm not sure you can actually fully do that. And two, how do you really derail what looks like it might be a more sticky inflation? And their worst nightmare is, you know, if something were to happen and they buoy the economy enough that they don't derail that inflation. Um, and you get something that is a more persistent bout of inflation. And you know, the errors, the Fed is the errors the Fed is trying to avoid, of course, are the 1970s and you know, sort of this more baked in inflation. But you know, as a risk hedging institution that the Fed is, I was a little surprised. Um, I don't get it at all. I mean, one week you're setting up a credit facility to provide liquidity to yeah. banks so that they can pay depositors. And then the next, literally the next week, it raise interest rates uh, on yeah. the same, that yeah. puts pressure on the same banks. I, it's yep. just, and it's a whole argument well, that you're trying to and, restore confidence. That makes no sense to me. I mean, because everyone knows that the banking system's under a lot of pressure and credit's a problem. So what, who's well, fooling who? Well, you know, and I, I, I you know, I, I, I have a lot of empathy for your views, but, and it's not just sympathy because I was at the same place. And, you know, if I was, you know, I'm not sitting at the table, so, you know, it doesn't really matter what I would have done. But, you know, looking at it from where we were, um, you know, the fact that the European Central Bank went, I think that was a different issue. And I wouldn't have used that as the, you know, the indicator. I do think one of the things they were worried about is they had 85 82 to 85% priced in a 25 basis point hike. 
And so the market was expecting it. That said, about over over that, fifty. That, they, they, that's because of what they they guided. I mean, they they if they had said one small thing, but they, they couldn't. It was a blackout period. Oh, okay, good point. I hadn't thought so, of that. Yeah, so, yeah. so part of what happened was we went from fifty <laughs> basis points, and right after that, we went into the blackout period where oh, the Fed point. did not speak. They couldn't. They couldn't guide. But I mean, if they, here, let me ask you this question: If they had done, if they paused, would we have seen r- red on the screen or green on the screen? You know, it's not clear to me. Not clear. And and, and I think that you could have messaged. I mean, the messaging is really difficult. And what's interesting is a recent study on on messaging. I mean, one, Chair Powell has more press conferences and has had them through a more volatile period in time than any Fed chairman. And so. Um, the volatility during the press conference is more than any other thing. The statement, the action, it's the press conference receiving the most volatility. And so the press conference really does matter. That said, um, you know, even taking out um, the recent study looked at even taking out sort of pre-pandemic press conference of Jay Powell versus other press conferences because they're longer um, and he's more willing to talk about these things in a different way. There's more volatility in financial markets as a result of that. Um, and we can say that's good, bad, or indifferent, but I think it's really important because it tells you how much power they have in messaging at the press conference. And I actually think you could have walked in and said, you know, we're going to pause right now. We're keeping all options on the table to go further. And I would have suspended their summary of economic forecast because given the uncertainty, we have a precedence for it, March of 2020. But, you know, why give a forecast? when you just don't know where the economy is going and how much credit tightening is already in the pipeline. So, you know, my preference would have been that. And um, I think you could have messaged through that saying, we believe in the stability of the system. And we're, you know, we're, we've got to, we're, we think there's a ring around this. We think we're in a, a we have a conditions um, and that, you know, we won't let it get out of hand. But the bottom line is, the Fed's goal was to tighten credit conditions and slow inflation and slow the economy. So, you know, my my view um, is probably aligned with yours on that. And I'm not sure that you can delineate financial stability and interest rates as much as the Fed would like to argue that you can. Not in because, this environment, you can't. Not when yeah. my mother-in-law is asking, hey, is my deposit safe? You know, is my save is my CD safe? in you know the local bank i mean it just you can't can't divorce the two but anyway here we are but but it's it it is and you know i mean you and i would have done it differently but you know we're not in that decision and you know i turned down the ability to be in that decision a couple times so you know that's you know it is what it is but it is it, it was a calculus they made and you could tell that you know they did i mean the fact that he admitted that they they thought about a pause yeah i think that was important hey and you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, it was it was pretty clear that this has been a rough couple of weeks. And, you know, just seeing, you know, Jay, Jay Powell's tenor, um, I, th- I think a lot of people forget. And I, and I think this is important, Mark, for you and I, too, because, you know, we think of this is just not data. This is people's lives, right? We, we're worried about people's lives. The economy is about people's lives. And these, you know, everyone hates the Fed. I see him as a political pinata all the time. And I don't always agree with him. But um, that these people internalize this and you can see it in their body language. You can see it in when you deal with them, how concerned they are about getting things right. And it's hard to get things right when you've got no visibility. And so in my view, when you got no visibility, you probably shouldn't be doing anything. Yep. Which is where we're at. Yep. But, well, it's like um, it's like a yeah. policy one hundred and one. If, uh, if you're unsure, you know, then you, you. I think that would argue strongly. You err on the side of accommodation. You don't. You don't press. Uh, you know. Yeah. You don't press on the brakes. You, you just don't press on the accelerator. But you know, take your foot off the brake for a little bit just to see well, what's just, going on. Just to take a breath. I mean, to me, yeah. I've always argued that fighting inflation is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way of putting and, it. And you know, you and I are runners, you know, and, and at some points in time you need to, I mean, there's the hardest mile is, you know, where a lot of central banks drop off, but it's, you know, and, and they and they fall short of the finish line. But part of, you know, getting through the hardest mile is focusing on getting overcoming, you know, mind and body that wants to stop, but it's also taking a moment. 
and focusing and taking a breath. And I think that's a good way to be thinking about this. And I thought it was, you know, I kept, you know, going with my colleagues and I, we debated this at length, you know, what do we think is going to happen? And we just kept saying, you know, given the risks, and they did, the Fed said, there's downside risks. We're raising rates with downside risks. Again. Okay, right. Yeah. I hear you. Right? Okay. You know? I mean, that was. That I'd was say crazy. we're pausing and there's downside risk. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, you're right, though. So, uh, so I think we're, we're sort of in a similar yeah. place, you and I, in yeah. terms of what we think, you know, I mean, I understand the inflation concerns, but I don't see these as, I didn't see this as, you know, and, and you know, Mohammed Alarian is a very good friend of mine. And I think the world of him and he's been, you know, the Fed's late. I mean, I argued the Fed was late. However, if the Fed had moved, you know, say three to six months sooner, quarter point moves, and they had realized it wasn't transitory a little sooner, um, we still would have had a very disruptive rate hiking cycle. The counterfactual on this is not that we'd be where we wanted to be and it would have been a nice smooth transition. And you know, I think that's a little disingenuous too. And just to raise rates because you want to look strong on inflation, I don't think the trade-off yeah, is between I, financial stability and inflation. I, I, I'm not at all critical of what the Fed did you know, a year ago. I mean, there, there was the pandemic. There was Russian invasion. I, you know, I, 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 you know, it was a mistake, obviously. But I wouldn't. Yeah. I, I don't think it's appropriate to criti- be critical of of them. But if they, you know, this move is on them. Uh, you know, and if yeah, it, yeah, this is on them. Uh, you know, this they, is harder. This is harder. Yeah. 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 Anyway, and, let's, and, let's, and and I was, you know, I I had it out there. Pregnant pause. You know, be ready to deliver if you need to. Otherwise, you know. Um, but you know that that it 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 was. They came to a consensus. I think they had to come to a consensus. But the fact that you also look at the dots and that someone was close to six percent, you know where there was pushback too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, let's play the game, the statistics game. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Let's Lighten do that. Up, yeah, I'm before we run out of time. Yeah. Yes. And uh, just to remind the folks, the game is uh, we <laughs> put forward a statistic. The rest of the group tries to figure that out with the uh, questions and clues and deductive reasoning. The best question. Or we should say the best statistic is one that's not so easy. We all get it immediately. Not uh, and one that's not so hard. We never get it. And if it's apropos to the topic at hand, uh, plus. And it's tradition to begin with uh, Marissa. Marissa, what's your statistic? Uh, it is fourteen point four percent. I know what it is. <laughs> I I Me want too. everyone. Me too. Me uh, too. Oh, everybody knows what that is. <laughs> God, I didn't think it was going to be this easy. <laughs> It was a light statistics week, I think. That's true. It kind of was, yeah. Uh, of course, I'll, I'll buy. I'll Diane, do you, do you have? It's, it's you, in the housing okay, market. Okay, right? on the count of three, we both say it. All right. It's not in the housing market. It's, but it's not related housing. to the housing market. Oh, but, okay. No, Chris, I I will bow to you. Go ahead. You 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 deserve the cowbell. That is the financial obligations ratio. That's right. That's oh, right. There you go. It's the financial obligations ratio in the fourth quarter of 2022. This just came out this week. This is data from the Fed. They put out data on the share of uh, household disposable income that is going to uh, debt payments. So there's also a debt service ratio that they put out that's accompanied by this. The financial obligations ratio is a bit broader because it includes things like rent for for people that are renting as opposed to homeowners it includes auto lease payments it includes um i think it includes uh homeowners insurance payments it's a bit broader so 14.4 percent very very low and pretty much unchanged over the last three quarters um and this is actually still lower than it was prior to the pandemic so if you go back in the months leading up to the pandemic the financial obligations ratio was 14.6 percent so we're almost there but it's extraordinarily low and it goes to both uh we know that debt is growing household debt is growing and the cost of debt obviously has gone up with with interest rate hikes, but income has gone up too. And so as a share of income, it's still very, very low. So I just, I picked this to show still the res- sort of resiliency and bulwark of you know household balance sheet strength in this economy, which probably goes a long way to explaining why we are not in a recession and haven't been yet. Absolutely. You know, why, um, you know, why the financial obligations ratio, the debt service burden, 
very low, stable. Why are we seeing these? It's not. It seems doesn't square with the big increase in delinquency that we're seeing in cards and uh, unsecured personal loans. Is it just that we're? It's. It's again. It goes back to the distribution. We can't look at the aggregates. We got to look at the distribution, and it's well, low income it households. Debt service is a lot higher. Is that what's going on? Yeah, and I think also yes. So delinquency rates for for auto loans and consumer installment loans are now higher than they were prior to the pandemic. And but rising for, fast, right? And rising. Yeah. But for yeah. the biggest part of debt, which is mortgages, they're still very low and they're still they're yeah, still yeah. lower than the, where, where they were. So yes, you have segments that are rising and you're right. That probably goes to, uh, it, I'm sure if you were to cut this by income, it would look very different for lower income households mm. than it would for middle or high income households. But it's still a relatively small piece of overall consumer debt when you take it in totality. Diane, think, you wanted to say something? Yeah, you know, on the in the auto lending business, as a result of in increases in interest rates. And um, that is something that I think you're seeing the subprime echo and the affordability in vehicles is really low. All cash purchases on vehicles. And um, I think the sticker price as a, I mean, the actual transaction price as of December was around 47,500 on average. That's a big check to write out for an all cash purchase for most people, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the demand for used vehicles has gone up yet again. and so. Um, the the subprime aspect of this really hard, particularly for lower income households that you know also got squeezed by higher gas prices, higher insurance costs, higher you know maintenance um, costs on their vehicles. All of those things, um, I think that's where you're seeing some stress. But it is an area that got that waiver, and so they kept lending in subprime, and so I'm not surprised to see it there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's move on. Chris, what's your statistic? All right. This one is difficult. Oh, but you would have uh, been, here's my hint. You would have, uh, during the pandemic and the teeth of the pandemic, you uh -huh. would have known what this number was. You would have been tracking this. Number of people sick with COVID? Nope. Let <laughs> okay. me give you the number first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just, I've just got 2, go 2,189,372. Oh my goodness. Say Did this come is this a statistic that came out last week? Uh the 22nd of March. Yes. Say it again. 2,189,372. 2, and it's a statistic we would have known in in the middle of the pandemic. When I'm thinking about it, it, it's not the number of people because the number of people who are out sick and unable to work um in the household survey was 1.3 million uh, from now. That also didn't come out last week. No. Is it, it is it job market related? No. Is, is it related it, to the banking it, situation? Oh, is no, it something the in banks. the unemployment claims? Nope. nope. Is it related to supply chains? No. <laughs> oh, is it is it is it a demographic statistic? No. 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 It is a number. It is the number of people. Is it related? No, it's not related. Is it related to the housing market? No. It was a statistic that you said that came out on it. Wednesday. <laughs> yes, it comes out uh, daily. Oh, comes out daily. Really? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Goodness gracious, six like give us. Can you give us one more hint without giving it away? <laughs> uh, it relates to uh, consumer activity. Oh, is it? Is the number PSA oh. throughput? No. Oh, what's that? PSA throughput. TSA checkpoint, number of people traveling oh, to TSA checkpoint. Diane, way to go. Got That's it. a great Got one. It. Yeah. That's Why did excellent. you pick that? I'm like, wait a minute. That's a, okay. <laughs> I would have never gotten that. That's yeah. great. Why did I pick this? Well, yeah. it's, uh, you know, we're looking for measures of uh, how consumers are responding. Yeah. Right? yeah. We're talking about yeah. the confidence. Yeah. But you got so me when you got when that's... I'm like, oh, it's the throughput number. So you, yeah. you gave it away. Yeah, uh, so spring break's not canceled yet. People are traveling. So yeah. this is right on par with where we were um, prior to the pandemic and higher. Like 2019, yeah. Yeah, 2019 I, and higher than 2019 what it was level. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so consumers and, so far, and, at least, are, uh, yeah, are reacting positively. So, so no sign yet of any. Of course, those were 
flights that were booked three weeks right. ago. Yeah. Weeks yeah. Ago. yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you a positive spin. Well, I, I'll take it. I'll definitely take it. Yeah, for sure. That's something okay, but that's a good thing to watch. watch. You're right? absolutely right. Let's watch that carefully. Yeah. That's a so, very good one. Um, I, in the labor market, and, and, and to add on to that, we hit um, an interesting uh, inflection point where we're finally seeing in the monthly labor market data, even though the number of people who are out sick and unable to work is still elevated relative to pre-pandemic levels, um, we're hitting month after month. February was the second highest record for the month of February, um, but December was a record, January is a record. The number of people out and unable to work because they're on vacation. Oh, in the household survey, I, I didn't know that. Was, neck. Is that that's, actually, a, that's a data point? Yeah. Is it a yeah. data point? I, I in the household survey, yeah. I Every did not know that. One situation. Yeah. That's so cool. And, and look what's at that. really cool now, and the inflection point now is that the number of people out on vacation has exceeded the number of people out sick and unable to work as well. Ah. Oh, that now we. I'm definitely going to start watching that every month. That's a good. That's a good one. Uh, it's a really good number. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very good number. Okay, Diane, you're up. What's your statistic? So sadly, you know, I didn't know it was had to be this week. So um, no, it does. It, it doesn't. No, no, no. Oh, okay, mine's yeah. one point eight million. One point eight million. Million. Is it related to UI claims? No. Okay. Is Labor it related market? to the job market? Yes. Is it from the household survey? Yes. Oh, okay. It's not what we just talked about. It's not people out sick. Nope. It's 1.3 million in February. Okay, because, all right, knew it was something like that. 1.8 million. Um, so, uh, uh, it can, okay, there's so many data points in that household <laughs> survey. I also know demographic. Multiple, I also have some really great data on um, the number of people with two full-time jobs, 12-month moving average, but. I'll, I'll get to that in a oh, minute. Oh my gosh, she's she's like a, a master player of this game. Is yeah. this people? <laughs> is this people not at work? Employed um, not at work no. for a particular reason? Nope. Is it a demographic nope. cut? Um, it really it's uh no, it's not no. a cut. Okay. Okay. But it is it is. It's it, it is it, it, it is a, it is from the household survey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it the number of people out of the labor force that say they want to work? I think that's lower than that. But mm -hmm. no. no. Okay. No. Um, is it, am I, are we in the right ballpark in, in terms of what uh, we're thinking? It, sorta, kind of, yeah. kind of, yeah. sorta. It's, uh, not, it's, not one, it, it's not an obscure number. It's not an obscure number. Okay. No. Okay. No. okay. Uh, well, uh, it's not the number of unemployed. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> is it people out of the labor force for, is it a cut of people out of the labor force? Nope. No, no. Nope. All nope. right. I, I think, I think we got to, we're, we're tortured here. I think we're going to have to okay. call it. Okay. So call the it. Go ahead. It is 1.8 million um, from February, 2020 to February, 2023 that the labor force grew by. That's oh. only 1%, oh. which is one third the pace of the 2010s. Ah. The number of foreign workers grew by 2.1 million. Hmm which means absent the number of foreign workers in the labor force, which caught up with the benchmark revisions in January and February, the January benchmark revisions to we've got more foreign workers, which have a higher participation rate, help to elevate participation in the labor market as well um, with net immigration. Um, it, we would have had a contraction in the labor force between February of 2020 and February of 2023 without immigration. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. That is a, an it amazing. Is. Yeah. And it's one third the pace of the 2010s. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the number of uh, foreign born in the labor force is kind of has been now has kind of been growing at its pace two pre point, pre pandemic. It's two, but it's 2.1 million above February 2020 to February 2023. So it's 300,000 down without the foreign borns. Yeah. But the, the the we're back to normal kind of sort of with the foreign born right the labor we're force. starting but to get the domestic uh, the uh, the uh, folks that are born here that's just so weird it's just so yeah. far for yeah. now obviously there's there's things like uh, retirement uh, there's things yep. like uh, parents with young children yep maybe some COVID in there effects there's also COVID. the the male situation I mean especially yeah. white men. Um, prime right. age white men and yep. um, 
great book. Uh, Richard Reeves. I don't know if you've read yep. the, his book. That's a terrific book on on male participation. But that we had a she session, and that still prime age men didn't come back, even though we had a lot of male dominated professions go up in demand. And um, women are much more likely to cross into male dominated professions, and men are to cross into women dominated mm. professions. Um, but it, really interesting. But I mean, the fact that, you know, the labor force is still, you know, we're not, we're really supply constrained yep. without immigration. And yeah, oh, absolutely. That, yep. You know, that gets so long. And, and also, I think there's some major issues that we need to think about in terms of everything. Um, we've had a record every month of people out on parental leave, which I think is a sign of expansion of parental leave, but also people, a record number of people out last month um, of people with childcare problems. And that is, you know, these are things that have persisted and got worse during the pandemic and um, are not uncoiling very rapidly. Yeah, that's a good one. That was a very good one. Uh, we were, I, weren't thinking, I wasn't thinking in terms of changes. I was thinking in terms of levels. So that it's, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, but I, know. I would never have gotten that anyway. So, hey, you want to hear my statistic? Yeah. Oh, last one. Statistic? Okay. I don't know if this is hard or easy. 17.6 trillion. And it, I'll give you a hint, a big hint. Uh, to move things along, it's uh, related to the banking situation crisis. Seventeen point six trillion. Is this the amount of borrowing at the discount window over the past? No, no, no. Seventeen point no. six no. trillion. No. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Fifty-eight billion and came down to hundred uh, trillion. 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 No, 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 no,
And obviously the comps, you know, the credit card data, the comps from a year ago, remember Omicron wave, the first one? Yeah. I mean, you know, that, you know, I mean, so, you know, you have that as well, but that feels um, like 20 years ago, but it was just, I know, I know, I know. I, I, yeah, I, I, said, you know, I, I used to say, you know, th- this was like aging in dog years. Now it's like aging in insect years, yeah. you know, yeah. the way that, I mean, you know, the, the last two weeks alone, but I, I think there's a really difficult time in, in trusting, you know, how the seasonal adjustment is of the data and, and they're, they're trying so hard. I give the, you know, statistical agencies a lot of credit for trying to do the best they can but how do you seasonally adjust against the surge in extreme weather events, against reopening and closing an economy? Um, and you know, how does how do we think about these you know measures? You know, like well, you know, Chris was saying, well, TSA throughput, you know, well, it's back you know to 2019 or a little above. That's our benchmark. But is that really the right benchmark either? You know, and then you add yeah. high frequency data into the equation where a lot of the high frequency data has no history to it. And we all, you know, flooded to it to look at it for the pandemic, but then does it have the same meaning going forward? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think uh, very difficult to understand what's going on, even if we had perfect data. <laughs> now throw in yeah, the, yeah, the, the yeah. data that we have. It's really obviously very difficult and 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 and, and, and humbling mean, by, obviously yeah 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 by using yeah. the data point that you're pointing to i mean it's it's it, it says you know yeah something it, it doesn't usually happen but it doesn't necessarily mean it, it could have been what was sustaining spending and helping to boy spending through an inflation bout yeah um you know i mean it's part of the resilience of the economy as well right yeah absolutely well um we've taken a fair share of your time. And I thought an hour, we're definitely well over an hour. So I, I think we probably should call it a podcast. Well, you know, I, I feel a little bit bad about that because I'd love to explore your pessimism in greater uh, detail uh, uh, because, uh, you know, that would fit right in with uh, with Chris's thinking. Uh, but uh, yeah. I don't think we have time for that at this at this time because I know you have to get going. But yeah. we'll, we'll definitely, if you're up for it, have you back and uh, sure. and, and hopefully – you're you're just dead wrong. I you know, on every level, I hope you're dead wrong. About yeah, you know, I mean, you know, some things you actually hope yourself you're dead wrong yeah, on because I hope you, know, you're you dead want wrong. you want you want to have people you want you don't want to have these disruptions yeah. in the economy. You yeah. know, absolutely. So I'm right there with you. Okay. Um, hope springs eternal. Indeed. And uh, well, with that, we're going to uh, uh, anything. Chris, Marissa, anything else you'd like to say? Are we good? We're good. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're going to call this a podcast uh, and uh, look forward. Uh, thanks. Thanks everyone for listening in and look forward to uh, uh, next week. Take care now.